Looking for magic cards or magic carps? TCG Player has all the singles you need to upgrade your decks. Import a list with mass entry and let the card optimizer do the rest. Use my affiliate link down below when shopping and you'll be supporting the channel at the same time. Hello and welcome to my list of the top 25 cards from the Brothers War that I think will have an impact on Standard, starting with a few honorable mentions, including Obstinate Beloth, a card that saw quite a bit of modern play, especially as a sideboard card when facing the Junt matchup, where Lilian of the Veil makes each player discard, and now you can cheat an Obstinate Beloth into play for free. Liliana's back in Standard, so Beloth could see a bit of sideboard play, also just a fine card against aggressive burn strategies. And then we also have Obliterating Bolt, which is a new take on the Lava Coil, dealing 4 damage to a creature and now also Planeswalker, exiling it in the process. Sadly, does not deal with Shieldred at 5 toughness, so that's what's keeping it from the top 25, but still worth a mention. And then Go for the Throat, another reprint that will potentially replace Infernal Grasp as the 2 mana removal spell of choice in some black decks, as it doesn't cost any life. But of course, the problem is that the Brothers War introduces a bunch of powerful artifact creatures that this won't be able to answer, so I'm not sure if it's going to fully replace Infernal Grasp. Then starting at number 25, we have Simeon Simulacrum, a 3-mana 2-1. When it enters the battlefield, put two plus one plus one counters on target creature you control, and it also has Unearth for 2 and double green, so we can bring it back from the graveyard, and it will enter with haste, and then we have to get rid of it end of turn. So the Simulacrum seems perfect for any aggressive green strategies. The fact that we can put those plus one counters on a creature that's already in play kind of feels like those counters have haste to an extent, and then with Unearth you can also leave those counters on a different creature since a simulacrum is going to go away end of turn so seems like a perfect card for the green stompy archetype at number 24 we have Surge Engine, a 2-mana 3-2 with Defender that can slowly be leveled up, reminiscent of cards like Ascendant Spirit and the more recent Evolved Sleeper that we can sink more mana into as the game progresses. This one starts out as a Defender, but if we pay blue mana it loses Defender and gains if this creature cannot be blocked, so it turns into an unblockable attacker. And then for 2 and a blue we can turn that 3-2 into a 5-4 instead, so it's not messing around. And eventually for 6 mana we get to draw 3 cards, can only activate that ability once. So this seems perfect for any blue tempo deck, just wants to play a cheap threat and then sit back on counter spells, as we can then use our mana if the opponent doesn't play into our counter spells to level up Surge Engine instead. At number 23, there's a Loyal Bodyguard, a red and a green for a 3-3, a legendary human soldier, both irrelevant creature types in standard, and it can be sacrificed, in which case legendary creatures we control get plus one plus zero and gain indestructible until end of turn. So the Bodyguard would fit perfectly in a 5 color Humans Joda deck, where we can use a Bodyguard to protect our team from any sweeper, and more importantly protect the Joda, which is a key card in the deck. Also very nice alongside the Partners as another powerful red-green legend, and also just decent stats for a 2-drop, so Watch Wolf has come a long way. Then at number 22 we have Urza's Silex, very similar to Karn's Silex as an artifact that can blow up the entire board. 3 mana to play, 4 mana to tap and exile, in which case each player chooses 6 lands they control, destroy all other permanents, can only be used at sorcery speed, and when the Silex is put into exile from the battlefield we can pay 2 generic mana, and if we do search our library for a Planeswalker card and put it into our hand. So this is perfect in a control strategy where you're going to have Planeswalkers naturally and then at 6 mana you have 4 mana to activate it, 2 leftover mana to search up a Planeswalker, so that works out nicely. So this could definitely see some play in those Planeswalker control decks. Then at number 21 there's Clay Champion, which is a pretty strange card if you look at the casting cost X and 4 generic mana, so we can play it for 4 mana or we can sink additional mana into it in the late game and starts out as a 2-2, but we want to play this in either a green and or a white deck, because Clay Champion enters the battlefield with 3 plus 1 plus 1 counters on it for each double green mana spent to cast it. So let's say we're playing Clay Champion in a mono green deck, we played on turn 4 for quadruple green, then it will enter with 6 plus 1 plus 1 counters on it, making it a 4 mana 8-8, eight, eight, which is not bad. And then if we take a look at the white counterpart here, when it enters the battlefield, choose up to 2 other target creatures you control, and for each double white spent to cast a champion, put a plus one plus one counter on each of them. So if we play this in a mono white deck, we can distribute two counters on two different creatures if we played on turn four, but we could also mix and match, maybe play this in a green white deck and get the best of both worlds, and then have a 5 5 that also gets to distribute two plus one plus one counters. So there's lots of interesting ways to use the clay champion. 
And then at number 20, there's a Lay Down Arms, single white for an uncommon sorcery, saying exile target creature with mana value less than or equal to the number of planes you control, and its controller gains 3 life. So a great removal spell in a control strategy where you don't really care about the opponent gaining some life. One mana is incredibly efficient, and it also exiles the creature, so very relevant against cards like Tenacious Underdog, and the new Unearth creatures from the Brothers War that might see a bit of play. So I could see this slotting into a blue-white control, deck or even just a mono white deck in which case it's going to be at its best then we've got Gwenna, Eyes of Gaia, a 3-mana 2-3 legendary elf druid scout that can tap, adding 2 mana in any combination of colors that we can only spend to cast creature spells or activate abilities of a creature or creature card. And then whenever we cast a creature spell with power 5 or greater, put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on Gwenna and untap it. So we can potentially cast a 6-mana creature as early as turn 4, cards like Tovalar's Huntmaster, also great with Defiler of Vigor, since we'll get to untap Gwenna and potentially cast another expensive creature alongside it and immediately get those plus one counters going. So I can definitely see this slotting into some green stompy decks, but also the fact that it makes two mana in any combination of colors means we could easily play this in a five color strategy as well. Then at number 18, there's Blade Coil Serpent, very similar to the Clay Champion, X and 6 mana for a 5-4, and when it enters the battlefield for each double blue spent to cast it, draw a card, which is probably the best mode here. Then for each double black, each opponent discards a card, for each double red it gets plus on plus and gains trample and haste until end of turn. So I feel like the Serpent is going to be at its best in a blue heavy deck, maybe blue reds you get the best abilities out of it, but of course you can mix and match and this could make for a great finisher in a control deck. Then there's Tokesha's Welcome, 3 mana enchantment, saying whenever one or more creatures with mana value 3 or less enter the battlefield under your control, draw a card. This ability triggers only once each turn. So reminiscent of a welcoming vampire, works a little bit differently instead of looking at the power of the creature, it looks at the mana value, but still functionally will fit into the same types of strategies. Great with cards like Wedding Announcement that will repeatedly make tokens. If you can play any creatures at instant speed during the opponent's turn, you can maybe draw twice per turn cycle, and could also fit into an enchantment build with Hallowed Haunting, providing a steady stream of tokens as well. Then at number 16, we've got a Melt Pair Urza, a Lord Protector, alongside the Might Stone and Weak Stone. So we can play Urza on turn 3, giving artifacts, instants, and sorceries a 1 mana discount. So we can potentially play a 4 mana Might Stone and Weak Stone on turn 4. And when it enters the battlefield, we get to choose between drawing 2 cards or giving a creature minus 5, minus 5 until end of turn. We can tap it for double colorless, and similar to the other power stones in the set, this mana cannot be spent to cast a non artifact spells, but it can still be used to pay for abilities, and Urza has a 7 mana activated ability that we could activate as early as turn 5 if we played a turn 4 Mind Stone and Weak Stone, and then if we both own and control Urza and the artifact named the Mind Stone and Weak Stone, exile them and melt them into Urza, Planeswalker. So Urza, a very powerful Planeswalker as you can see, starts out at 7 loyalty and says you may activate the loyalty abilities of Urza twice each turn rather than only once and we've got five abilities to choose from, so a lot of different options, starting with the plus two, saying artifacts, instants, and sorceries. This turn costs two generic and less to cast, and we also gain two life, so activate that twice, and now we get a four mana discount instead. We can also plus one to draw two cards and then discard a card. The zero ability makes a pair of 1-1 one, one colorless soldier artifact creature tokens. The minus three exiles target a non-land permanent, so we could just play Urza and exile two permanents and still have a one loyalty planeswalker left over, and the minus 10 gives us access to a powerful sweeper, saying artifacts and planeswalkers we control gain indestructible until end of turn, and then destroy all non-land permanents. So if we can ever get Urza planeswalker in play, it's gonna take over the game very quickly. The question is, are the Mightstone and Weakstone and Urza Lord Protector individually powerful enough to see play? That way, if we don't necessarily draw both, they will still be good enough by themselves. And I think the answer is yes, especially if we can build around the one mana discount from Urza. And then, of course, at number 15, we have Urza's brother, Mishra, claimed by Gix, 4 mana, 3, 5, saying whenever we attack, each opponent loses X life and we gain X life, where X is the number of attacking creatures, so Mishra himself doesn't even need to be attacking and can have an immediate impact the turn we play him. 
And then Mishra pairs with Phyrexian Dragon Engine, which is a card I believe could see play in some red aggressive decks even without Mishra, as a 3 mana 2 2 with a double strike. And then it also has Unearth for a 3 and double red, in which case when it enters a battlefield from our graveyard, we may discard our hands, and if we do, draw 3 cards. So a perfect way for an aggressive deck to refuel. Once it's empty handed, we get a nice 2 2 double strike that can get a nice hidden, and also refresh our hands by drawing 3 cards. And then if we manage to attack with both Mishra and the Dragon Engine, which could easily happen around turn 5, either by curving Dragon Engine into Mishra and attacking, or even if the opponent kills our Phyrexian Dragon Engine, we could unearth it on turn 5, and then still melt the pair into Mishra, lost to Phyrexia, which will enter the battlefield tapped and attacking, so we get to choose 3 out of the 6 different modes right away, and those include target opponent discards 2 cards, Mishra deals 3 damage to any target, we can destroy an artifact or planeswalker, Creatures we control gain menace and trample until end of turn. Creatures we don't control get minus one minus one until end of turn. Or create two tapped power stone tokens. So a ton of powerful options to choose from. And Mishra will very quickly take over the game. And then at number 14, there's a Brotherhood's End, a 3 mana sorcery speed sweeper in red that can deal 3 damage to each creature and each planeswalker, an effect we haven't had in standard for a little bit. Or we can destroy all artifacts with mana value 3 or less if that lines up better. So definitely an important new tool for red control decks. At number 13, I'm cheating a little bit and I'm including three different cards that I believe could fit into the same archetype, starting with one with the multiverse, an 8 mana mythic rare enchantment, saying we may look at the top card of our library anytime, and we may play lands and cast spells from the top of your library, so kind of like a future sight effect. But there's more, it also includes a bit of omniscience power here, saying once during each of your turns you may cast a spell from your hand or the top of your library without paying its mana cost. So that's a very important addition to the future sight effect. Of course we're not going to pay 8 mana for one with the multiverse, instead we can try and cheat it into play from our graveyard if we manage to discard it earlier, either with invoke justice, or we can potentially cast a new repair and recharge a 5 mana sorcery that can return an artifact, enchantment or planeswalk card from our graveyard to the battlefield and also makes a tapped power stone token and other cards we could cheat into play this way include Cityscape Leveler, 8 mana 8 8 Trampler, that when we cast it or when it attacks lets us destroy up to one other, targets a non land permanent, and its controller creates a tapped Power Stone token, and it also has Unearth for 8 mana. And then a Portal to Phyrexia, probably the more exciting one, a 9 mana Mythic Rare Artifact, saying when the portal enters the battlefield, each opponent sacrifices 3 creatures, so that has an immediate stabilizing effect. And then at the beginning of your upkeep, put target creature card from a graveyard onto the battlefield under your control, and it's also Phyrexian in addition to its other types, so this can reanimate opposing creatures that we maybe made them sacrifice, but it can also reanimate some more creatures from our graveyard, like maybe the Cityscape Leveler. And then next up at number 12, there's Arcane Proxy, 7 mana for a 4-3, although it also has Prototype, so we can also cast it for 3 mana, in which case it will enter as a 2-1 instead, and when the Proxy enters a battlefield, if we cast it, exile target instant or sorcery card with mana value less than or equal to the Proxy's power from our graveyard, copy that card, and we may cast the copy without paying its mana cost. So reminiscent of Snapcaster Mage, of course it's lacking Flash, and it also limits what kind of spells we can replay out of the graveyard, but still seems great in kind of a blue-red burn strategy where we can get back a lightning strike from the graveyard and also add a 2-1 creature to the board. Then at number 11, another card that could fit into the same style of deck is Third Path Iconoclast, 2 mana for a 2-1, saying whenever we cast a non-creature spell, create a 1-1 colorless soldier artifact creature token, so reminiscent of Young Pyromancer, which only triggered off instants and sorceries, so this is a significant upgrade as it can also trigger off cards like enchantments, planeswalkers and artifacts, so this could also fit nicely in kind of a blue-red burn strategy. And at number 10, there's Steel Seraph, another prototype creature that we can play for 3 mana in a white deck, in which case it's a 3-3 flyer, saying at the beginning of combat on our turn, target creature we control gains our choice of flying, vigilance or lifelink until end of turn, so we'll make it very hard for opposing decks to race, as we can just gain lifelink, and against other creature decks we can maybe fly over any board stall with flying, so very versatile card. And of course can also be played for 6 mana, in which case it's a 5-4, it's also a great mana sink in the late game, but for the most part we're looking to cast it for 3 mana, and I could see this slotting into some white aggro decks. 
At number 9 we have our first true Planeswalker, Sahili Filigree Master, 2 a blue and a red for a 3 loyalty Planeswalker, and we're often gonna start with a minus 2, making a pair of 1-1 one -one Thopter tokens with flying, they also gain haste until end of turn, and then we can maybe start using the plus 1 to scry 1, and then we can also tap an untapped artifact we control if we do draw a card, and the minus 4, which we can get to very quickly, gives us an emblem saying artifact creatures we control get plus 1 plus 1, and artifact spells we cast cost 1 generic a less to cast, so perfect in any artifact strategy, but it could also maybe fit into kind of a Grixis midrange deck, where we have blood tokens from Blood Tithe Harvester that we can maybe tap to draw extra cards, and the 1-1 one -one Thopters also give us an alternate angle of attack. And then at number 8 we have another Planeswalker, Teferi, Temporal Pilgrim, 5 mana, starts out at 4 loyalty, and has a passive ability saying whenever we draw a card, put a loyalty counter on Teferi, and the 0 ability, which essentially turns into a plus 1 ability, lets us draw a card, and then the minus 2 makes a 2-2 blue spirit creature token with vigilance, and the ability whenever we draw a card, put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on this creature, so it will passively pick up more counters over time, and of course synergizes very well with Teferi's 0 ability, and the minus 12 ultimate can also be backbreaking, saying target opponent chooses a permanent they control and returns it to their hand, and then they shuffle each non-land permanent they control into its owner's library, so that can also reset the board nicely. At number 7 there's Phyrexian Flesh Gorger, another prototype creature, this one in black, so 3 mana for a 3-3 with Menace and a Lifelink, and the ability Ward, pay a life equal to the Flesh Gorger's power, so if you try and take it out with spot removal it's gonna cost you 3 life, or if we cast it for 7 mana we get a 7-5 with Menace, a Lifelink and the same Ward ability, which will now cost 7 life instead, so it seems like a great addition for the Black Aggro archetype, even though it will compete with a Graveyard Trespasser and Liliana at 3 mana, which are both great as well. At number 6 there's a Sky Strike Officer, 3 mana for a 2-3 human soldier with flying, saying when the officer attacks create a 1-1 colorless soldier artifact creature token, and we can tap 3 untapped soldiers we control to draw a card. So that reminds me of the 1 mana zombie crypt breaker that can tap 3 untapped zombies to draw a card, of course this is a bit more expensive, but there are a ton of soldiers in standard right now, including soldier tokens, so we'll make it pretty easy to draw a card with the officer the turn we play it, and then once it starts attacking it can make an army of soldier tokens that can also turn into extra card advantage, so the officer could be the key card for the soldier archetype in standard. And at number 5 we have another great reprint, Monastery Swift Spear, 1 mana for a 1-2 with haste and prowess. Very simple but also very effective, and this card has seen play in pretty much every red deck across every format, so this will surely see play in standard as well. And then at number 4 there's Misery's Shadow, 2 mana for a 2-2, saying if a creature an opponent controls it would die, exile it instead, which is usually a good upside. And then for 1 mana, can be any color of mana, Misery's Shadow gets plus 1 plus 1 until end of turn. So an amazing ability that we're used to seeing on shades, but never quite this effective, usually at least costs a single black to activate, so that means we could play Misery's Shadow in an aggro deck that's not necessarily mono black, even though mono black aggro in standard right now wouldn't mind having an extra powerful 2 drop, as there are quite a few flex slots at 2 mana right now. And then at number 3 there's Siege Veteran, if you missed a Luminarch Aspirant it's almost back in the form of a 3 mana 2-2, two -two, saying at the beginning of combat on your turn put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on target a creature you control, and whenever another non-token soldier you control dies, create a 1-1 one -one colorless soldier artifact creature token. So having played Luminarch Aspirant of course we know how powerful this effect can be, 3 mana is a significant downgrade from 2 mana, but we also get an extra ability in return, and there's quite a few powerful soldiers in mono white aggro standard decks nowadays, including Guardian of New Benalia, Brutal Cathar is a soldier, and even Thalia Guardian of Thraben, so it will slot in perfectly in mono white aggro, but could also see play in some multicolor soldier tribal decks. And then at number 2 I'm grouping a few different cards here, and it's the remaining pain lands, 4 new pain lands added to standard to complete the entire cycle, so we've got Battlefield Forge, especially important for those red-white aggro decks that want their lands to come into play untapped, then we've got Brush Land, Lenore Wastes, and finally Underground River, so this will definitely see a ton of play across different decks in standard. 
And then at number one, the card that I expect to see the most play in standard is Mishra's Foundry, a creature land, and the creature lands recently rotated out of standard, so now all the monocolor decks especially are going to be very happy to add four Mishra's Foundries to their decks, as it can turn into a 2-2 assembly worker artifact creature until end of turn for just two mana, so very similar to Mutavolt, and it does not have that same creature type ability as Mutavolt, but it does also have an extra ability for one mana we can tap it, and then target attacking assembly worker gets plus two plus two until end of turn so it kind of works with additional copies of itself so if the opponent has a bunch of three three creatures out for instance we can maybe pump one of our mishra's foundries up to a four four instead of having a bunch of two twos that cannot attack so that extra ability will certainly also come in handy and i could even see some two color decks stretching their mana bases to make room for mishra's foundry just because creature lands are so impactful to have in standard so yeah, that concludes my top 25 cards from the Brothers War. Agree or disagree? Did I leave out any important cards? Let me know in the comments. But for now, I want to thank you for watching, hope you enjoyed, and as always, have a nice day. I also want to thank all my patrons for being part of the channel, and you can become a patron yourself today and decide the topic of future videos over at patreon.com forward slash legendvd.